Today on The Henry Rollins Show, screen legend Jeff Bridges will be joining us to share tales from a lifetime of brilliant acting. Ben Harper will join Heidi May with an exclusive performance from his politically charged album, Both Sides of the Gun, and I'll acknowledge the mothers that our president refuses to. Don't go away. It's going to be a great show. With the sheer overload of information we are now assaulted with and the high-speed access with which we have access to tons more information, I wonder if we're not as often overwhelmed as we are empowered. Now that we have a handful of Blackberry and blue teeth hanging from our ears, are we really getting more done or taking more time talking to people we don't want to far too often, sorting through unwanted text messages, risking identity theft, and looking to upgrade rather than to improve? I like technology. I have a computer, a cell phone, I have an iPod, and I use them all all the time. But what good is technology when we use it as a crutch rather than a tool? Are you old enough to have lived in a time when your room was the four walls and a door that was the training camp for your rapidly developing imagination? You had imaginary friends you talked to. You spaced out and figured out how your mind worked. Now kids have no need to let their minds wander. They can be assaulted and molded by someone else's imagination in high definition. Why do you need a GPS system in your car? Have the streets in your city changed all that much in the last 50 years? It's like no one knows how to get anywhere anymore. As you get the GPS coordinates for your mission to the shopping mall, you're also being tracked and all that data can be recorded and stored. And I don't know about you, but I think people I don't know have enough access into my life as it is. And besides that, what are you, a fucking child? You need Tommy the fucking car to tell you how to get across town? I thought they didn't let feeble-minded motherfuckers behind the wheel. Now, what are you gonna tell your kids when they ask you what you did when you were young? Are you gonna tell them you hung around and spent countless hours on a cell phone talking mind-numbing bullshit to your friends who called you incessantly to ask you who you were just talking to because you had the I spent my youth swinging from technology's tit and doing nothing of any great importance plan? And to make them respect you, you can add that you used to get really crazy back in the day when you would steal music from the internet. Your sons will roll up their prayer mats, go to the madras, and never return your text messages ever again. Joining me now is the extremely talented Jeff Bridges, whose roles in movies like Fearless, The Fabulous Baker Boys, The Big Lebowski, and The Door in the Floor have confirmed him as a film legend. He has three new films being released in the coming months, Stick It, Tideland and the Amateurs. And he was kind enough to take a break between making the films to talk to us today. Jeff, Damn. thanks for coming all in. All right, good to be here. So uh, of all these films, like the, the three, Tideland, Stick It, and the Amateurs, I'm really interested in the Amateurs. So <laughs> tell me about that one. Well, what, do you, what can you say about it? It's always hard to, this is kind of the first time I've really uh, spoken about it, but um, I guess to put it in a nutshell, you're familiar with uh, Frank Capra, of course, yep. right? So if you imagine Frank making a, a porn film, or an adult film, that's, that's pretty much uh, the amateurs. It's got, it's got a lot of uh, risque, uh, vulgarity, uh, uh, married with uh, a lot of heart. So it's, it's a bizarre combination, but it works. I think it, it'll uh, you know, make you laugh, hopefully. Because you know there is a very popular Thing in America, you know, swingers, like really normal, Midwestern, like middle American adults who get together, kids are all gone off to college, they got their, <laughs> yeah. their grandparents, some of right. them, and they just toss their clothes off and mix it up, and there's a lot of this you can find on the internet, so it's uh -huh. not like I'm collecting That's on DVDR, right. right. <laughs> but these are probably like really good people, you know, just normal, good, God-fearing folks who went like, screw it, let's have some fun. 
it's, a, it's got a bit, of, a bit of that, and it takes place in, you know, Americana, you know, any little town in America, and uh, it's really, they're really doing it to uh, to make some money and, right. to, and to make a success of themselves. That's, so he's, uh, and, and the character that I play is kind of the ringleader and gets these guys together, and uh, it's, um, we'll see how, we'll see how it goes. I'm, I haven't seen it in its entirety yet. I'm looking right. forward to it. Well, having made the film, has it changed your, your take on pornography at all? No, no, not really. No, uh, it's uh, you know it's it's more of a uh, the the uh, adult film aspects of it. Uh, I mean, they're certainly there, but it's not like a uh, it's not even a soft core, uh, you know, film. It's really more about uh, the human condition, how guys are trying to better themselves, and they just happen to do it through this um, you know adult film angle. What does it take to make you interested in a script, to want to go up and, you know, throw five months of your life into something, or...? I have a very bizarre sort of uh, way I, I approach it. Usually, uh, uh, I, I have to be kind of dragged to the party. It takes a lot for me to, to get going because, um, well, for a number of reasons. One, I know what it takes once you commit. Yeah. And uh, and then also all the doors that you don't get to go through if you pick one, and then you know you're not going to be able to do these, you know, other gigs that you might want to do. But um, on a good day, when, when something that really strikes me, if it's kind of a movie that I'd like to see, and one that I haven't seen before that's unusual, that will usually uh, get my attention. And uh, and then if the filmmakers are uh, ahead of you, you know, ahead of the audience, where you're you know, you don't have it, you can't have it quite figured out. You know, you think you know where this is going and it goes somewhere else. That's always interesting for me. How do you avoid getting typecast? <laughs> I've really uh, kind of uh, purposely gone after not being typecast because my father, uh, who was also an actor, Lloyd Bridges, uh, it was great for him. He did this TV show back in the late 50s, uh, early 60s. You probably remember it, Sea Hunt. Sure. And he was, they thought, you know, he pulled that p part of a skin diver off so well that people thought he was a skin diver and he got offered a lot of skin diving roles in the movies. So he, I saw what that, you know, how difficult that was for him. So I've, I've really gone about trying to shake it up, you know, and that's another thing that will attract me to a film. You know, if I'll play, uh, you know, Lebowski, you know, then, you know, the next, uh, maybe the next year a script uh, play the president of the United States right, will contender. come along, the contender, something like that. That'll say, oh, well, yeah, that'll be interesting. I can see you 10 years from now, 15 years from now, still doing really interesting stuff from like the indie stuff, the big movies, and doing all kinds of roles. You know, you 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 really keep it interesting, and it, I think it's uh, something to be admired. Well, it's for for myself too. You know, keep it interesting for myself, and also that I don't know. I have this theory. And I'm not. I don't know how much water it holds, but to um, kind of uh, confuse the audience in a in a good way, not to uh, develop such a strong persona. So if you see me as the dude, then you can. You know, it takes a while, but you you you. Uh, you know, imagine me as that character, then the, the president. If I played the dude too many times, it'd be very hard to... Yeah, yeah you, you know, you'd be screwed. Yeah, so I kind of, like, mix it up and try to play as many different kind of guys, and that, uh, hopefully that's easier for the audience to, you know, put me into that character that I'm playing in the movie they're seeing. With, with the, the Big Lebowski, where you played the dude, did did you get chased around by people wanting you be... To, to be the cool stoner for like the, the, the <laughs> next three years because you did it so well. It was sure. such a great movie. Oh, absolutely, movie. yeah, yeah. But uh, one of the one of the uh, really cool things that's come out of that movie is you know about the Lebowski festivals. That no, they have, they have them all over the country. They they pop. Where up. people just get they get and ripped on white Russians they, they, and don't like worry about day, stuff for a weekend. It's a two or three day party <laughs> of bowling, uh, jamming, you know, music, and uh, I got to you know get some guys together and play it up there and have a, you know playing to a sea of dudes. You oh, know, what, so you, oh, you 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 oh, actually oh, go yeah, and stir oh, it up? Oh, I went I went there was one in L. A. and I went to it last year. It was a it was a ball. The movies playing on the walls, all you know, it's crazy. Yeah, it's such, I, I've seen that movie at least three or four times. It's so great. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, as a guy who sees more movies than he makes, that be me, you know, buying the ticket and going, a lot of my cinematic heroes now dial it in. 
you know, they just do that same, I'm not gonna name any names, mm -hmm. no need to do it. But people who rocked me in the 70s and 80s, I see them now making that movie every 10 months, where they're oh, like, oh, right. you're doing the thing again. Wow, that was 9.50, yeah. I'm not getting back for yeah. you to do that thing you did the last five years I've seen you do that thing. Yeah. Artistically, you have stopped. And it's nice to see some people who just keep going for open road. Oh, well, it's that funny thing. I get that feeling, you know, you were saying what, what, uh, what draws you to a particular script. One of the things that's kind of maddening, but it's, it's true, is if I'm reading a script and I'll, it'll piss me off for some reason, it'll repulse me, and I'll say, oh, that's a, how could they send me that, you know? Yeah, so read it again, I say, oh, do you really want me to read it again? Oh, I read it again, maybe three or four times. And usually that's a sign there's something in there, <laughs> you know, that, that gets, me, gets me going. I don't know what it is, and it's, it's, it, there's a certain uh, um, uncertainty about whether you can pull it off, you know? I mean, uh, you know, uh, we were talking about Terry Gilliam. I remember when, when we were doing The Fisher King, and he came to me with his part, and I, you know, want, admired him, and I liked the, um, like Robin, you know, chance to work with him, sure. and the script was great, and I said, but Terry, you really see me as this guy? I don't get it. You know, have you thought about this actor, or this guy? You know, so I'd try to talk him out yeah, of it. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't, well, I didn't want to screw him, I didn't want to screw up the yeah. movie, you know? But I, yeah, I, I would kind of an anti-agent, you know, on myself. Well, maybe it's that, that, that imbalance or bit of fear factor or, or uncertainty that keeps it fresh. Yeah, maybe so. It keeps you, you know, going. Like I said, so many people, they, they find that comfort zone and it probably pays really well and they just cruise. And I think in art, one should not cruise. Miles Davis yeah, never cruised. Yeah. John Coltrane right, never cruised. You know, right, they, they, yeah. they kept it like, okay, the, you know, as soon as we established it, new lineup, back to uncertainty and critics going, why, why, yeah, oh, exactly, you know, which right. is, I think you oh, gotta sure. keep shaking it up. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, um, is, there, is there a role that you've always searched for, have not had yet? Do you remember uh, in New York, uh, back in the 60s, this fella Moondog, were we talking about this? Who Moondog, used to, who the, used to the stand blind on, guy? Yeah, the bland, blind sure. viper, right. And so you're hip to his music, right? Yeah. I mean, he's got I, very I, I wild music. I have three music. or four yeah. of the CDs. As, yeah, that's on, uh, I turned T-Bone on to him. He put him in uh, Lebowski. He's, a, he's in the Lebowski soundtrack. Oh, wow. Um, he wrote a lyric that Janis Joplin used, All Is Loneliness, yeah, I think. It's yeah. one of her heaviest ever songs she did with Big yeah, Brother and the yeah, Holding Company, yeah, I believe. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> maybe I can play him, man. Yeah! Isn't that a wild, because his story is like, And the outfit. Do you know, do you know what happened to him? Was he, did he eventually move to Europe or something? Yes. Okay. There There's you this go. young German girl. I knew it was German. Okay. You know, got him and said, let me take you to the fatherland, you know, where Beethoven is, you know. And uh, it, because in New York, although Bernstein would, you know, Leonard Bernstein would write his liner notes. I mean, he was amongst the music community. Yeah. People who knew he was something, but I always thought he was a homeless guy. Or I didn't, you know, I didn't know. It's kind of a wanderer. Yeah, yeah, he was always there, rain yeah. or shine. But um, that he was the really he was the real thing. I mean, you know, wonderful composer. And so she took him to Germany, took all his persona, all that Viking stuff, yeah. shaved his beard and his thing, and dressed him in double knit suits. And he just flourished his last few years. It was really a you know really uh, celebrated in Germany. Because I know he he recorded prolifically. Towards the end? As a matter of fact, go on iTunes and check out, I think it's called The German Years, and it's a kind of like a massive thing, and there's live performances of what he was doing, and it's some really good stuff. You should do this. Oh, yeah, I think, I, I like I mean, this th story. I like, that's you know, a great huh? story. Isn't that a nice story? Yeah. I like that arc, so, you know, maybe. Yeah, and you need some horns. That's I get, yeah, You gotta get have horns. that. Yeah, I just had, you know, I just had, I had a full beard, I just shaved it, so I, that's what, I think what made me think of, uh, of Moondog. Well, I I, uh, I look forward to that, and I, I look forward to all your stuff because you you you, uh, you you keep me interested in, in what you do. Oh, thank you. And uh, thanks for being on my show. All right, You're a hell of a guest. All right, thanks all right. a lot, Henry. Coming up later in the show, a musical performance by Ben Harper. But first, this. Dear Pat Robertson. I would like to compliment you on having the psycho vision to stand up and say the things that some people, a lot of people, people who read, travel and think for themselves, would find repellent 
illogical, and just plain wrong. You don't let overwhelming amounts of facts get in the way of your conclusions, and that is refreshingly psychotic. Like that time you said the September 11th attacks were carried out by pagans, abortionists, feminists, gays, lesbians, the ACLU, and the people for the American way? And here I was all this time thinking it was Al-Qaeda operatives from the Middle East. Boy, was I taken for a ride. And to think Vice President Dick Cheney's daughter and Ellen DeGeneres may have been in on this has really made me have to stop and rethink the whole thing. And I've come to the conclusion that you are a gold medalist psycho. The president said we were fighting a global war on terror and sent in thousands of soldiers into Iraq to take care of business. But if I'm understanding you correctly, we should redirect the troops to invade America or at least stop those damn queer liberal bastards from taking flying lessons or getting married. I hear you, I think. Oh yeah, that time where you said feminism was a socialist anti-family political movement that encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism and become lesbians? Now Pat, you know you're starting to sound a little like, or a lot like, the Taliban. Are you trying to enact some kind of blue-collar comedy tour Sharia for idiots? Remember a few months ago when you said someone should put a hit on Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez? Your psychotic bullshit is only outweighed by your naivete. You sure put the mental into fundamentalism that day. Pat, you're part koala bear, part Koresh, and every bit the psychotic con man for the new American century. And make no mistake, a long time ago, your God looked at you, said, what a fucking psycho, and abandoned you. But don't despair. You still have me, Henry. And now, here's Heidi May with this week's musical performance from Ben Harper. Thanks, Henry. Since his debut album in 1994, Ben Harper has established himself as one of the world's most versatile and hardworking musicians. With the release of his seventh studio album, Both Sides of the Gun, Ben offers his signature mix of rock, soul, and folk while embracing the roots of his early intimate records. Joined by Michael Ward on guitar, performing Gather Around the Stone, this is Ben Harper Uncut. I read in the newspaper where a woman wanted an answer as to why her son died in the war that's going on right now and no one could give her an answer uh, that was to her satisfaction. And um, her son died and they put his ashes, they spread his, a they put his ashes in teardrop shaped lockets and gave them to the entire family to wear. And uh, so I wrote this song. It's called Gather on the Stone. See, and the thing is, too, see, they always say, well, he died for freedom. But, you know, that excuse is kind of dated, and it, it's not, that excuse insults the intelligence of an entire nation. So I just thought I'd throw that out there, too. Say, hey, 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 gather round the storm. You're too young to know that you're too young to go. There's no freedom to be found lying face up in the ground. Say, hey, 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 gather round the storm. Hey, 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 gather round the storm. Ashes from an unfinished life for all that's left in a teardrop shaped locket hanging from his mother's chest. Say, hey, 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 gather round the stone. Hey, 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 gather round the stone. Say, hey, 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 gather round the stone.
freedom till it bleeds an oil stream. Then you sail down upon it in your killing chain. Say, hey, 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 gather round the stone. Hey, 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 gather round the stone. Old men who send children off to die in vain. They will hear death's constant whisper call. Thank you again to my guests, Ben Harper and Jeff Bridges. Before we go, let me say that as people take time to praise their mothers, I need to give our end of credits to Cindy Sheehan and Julia Ward Howe. Although her message has become muddled in the months since her original protest, we can't forget that Cindy Sheehan was first and foremost a mother who lost her soldier son to the Iraq War. By taking a stand outside President Bush's Texas Dude Ranch, Sheehan became the living personification of the frustration and rage that so many Americans felt at Bush's poorly planned, ideology-fueled war. Julia Ward Howe is best known, if she's known at all, for penning the Civil War era Battle Hymn of the Republic. Sick of the inhumanity of war, Howe spread the idea of a Mother's Day for Peace, a day that she hoped would celebrate the inherent peacefulness of mothers and perhaps lead to female solidarity in the face of war and violence. Her version of Mother's Day never really took root, and instead, America got a hallmark holiday of exchanging cheaply sentimental cards. So, as you dial your mom long distance, think about all the soldiers' mothers who won't be getting calls. And remember that there's one man who's ultimately responsible. And W, don't forget to tell your mom Barbara hi for me. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.